Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program. This is a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew, author of the Infinity series and founder of Engine Books. Let's see what we have today. Thank you very much for joining us for a special episode of the Right Project podcast. I know I say they are all special. This one definitely is. We have on with us Andrew Hawthorne, currently best known for his work with the CBC as a, as a wonderful journalist. Uh, but I know him as the author of Silver and Voices from Mythology from the Rock, the, the best-selling 2021 anthology. Uh, and previous to this, I knew him as the author of Mirror Appendix uh, from Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number 54, January 2009. Andrew Hawthorne, uh, in your opinion, what are the ethics of writing about historical figures, real-life historical figures? What are the ethics of writing about real life historical figures? Um, gosh, if you're writing fiction, I don't think that there's much in the way of ethics. You can you can do whatever you want with them. They're yours now. They're dead anyway. They don't care. Um, sure. I, I think if you're writing nonfiction, that you you aren't allowed to do that anymore. And and you you know like I'm a journalist and I'm a comic book writer. And being a journalist, uh, you you were writing about historical figures, but the history is still happening when you write about news. And being a journalist isn't like being a normal person because you are granted things by your society. You're granted a platform and you're granted access to be able to tell those stories, but things are taken away from you as well. You're not allowed to have political opinions. You're not allowed to engage in politics on a citizen level. And you shouldn't be because we're, the, the, the world is trusting you to be able to give an unbiased truth about what's going on instead of tell us what you think is the good and bad of it so that way lies fox news and nobody wants right. that and and lots of lot and you know it, and you don't even have to go as far as fox news or something you don't. like like everybody is is fighting that battle in themselves because everybody's a normal human being but it's a serious responsibility to to understand like you're you've kind of been pushed outside of, and i've spoken to journalists who don't even vote because they feel that that would compromise how they write about the people that they're voting for. And they'll start voting again when they stop being journalists. Um, Interesting. You know, that's controversial. So if you're writing nonfiction, then I think that there's an immense weight of ethics on you to, to fight against your own inclinations and biases to, to show this. Um, or, or just to be upfront and say, like, you're making an argument. Like, my argument is that Horatio Nelson was an imperialist jerk who hung a guy from a yard arm. Or my argument is Horatio Nelson was the greatest um, uh, admiral in the history of naval warfare. And I'm going to show, like, that's fine. One of my favorite historians uh, ever writes completely biased pro Horatio Nelson books that are awesome. They're really good books, but he's very upfront about that stuff. Yeah. Um, if you're writing fiction though, and you're like, man, I'd really like to make Horatio Nelson a Martian who was just wearing a skin face. Yeah. Uh, then that's cool, and you're allowed to do that. I would love to do that. That sounds great. Do it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Andrew Hawthorne, do you ever Google yourself? And if so, what comes up? How happy are you with the results? Um, I don't Google myself a lot because uh, Andrew... Andrew Hawthorne is my, my second name. My original name was Andrew Bonia. And uh, I changed that uh, when my wife and I changed our last names. Andrew Bonia is a very distinctive name. There's no other Andrew Bonia in the world. So it was very easy to Google myself. Um, so I just Googled the crap out of myself. But Andrew Hawthorne, there are a few more Andrew Hawthorns. And particularly, there's a book called like The Curious Adventure of Mr. Andrew Hawthorne, which I haven't read yet and sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> because I do have curious adventures now and then. Mm -hmm. um, but Googling myself in general isn't that useful. <laughs> and, no. uh, and you know, there's another thing too where um, as, as a journalist, as a journalist, um, 
every now and then I have been in charge of moderating comments on the stories that we're putting out, not even necessarily stories that I put out. Before that, I would never read tweets and comments about stuff that I had anything to do with if I could avoid it. Sure. And that kind of stuff, um, it can really hurt your soul uh, unless you adopt, you, you know, after a while you realize that um, like the people who are kind of hating on you online, um, you're in a duel with, and you won already, you drew first blood. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you have the platform. You're the one that put out the book or the piece of journalism or the They're song. They're commenting the, on your thing. Yeah, like, exactly. The, yeah. So like responding and saying, no, you suck is, is just yeah. hurting yourself right back when you've already beat them. <laughs> and, yeah. and they probably like, if, if they care about something so much that they want to trash you online, then they probably deserve to be really angry throughout their lives. And you've already helped them with that. So yeah. um, I find Googling yourself, especially in the age of social media can be more damaging than not, uh, even though everybody wants to see the good reviews yeah, or whatever, but it's not worth it. Back in the day before, and I mean, nowadays reviews, mostly like when I go looking for reviews of engine books or my books or whatever, I'm just going to Amazon and Goodreads, just bouncing between those two, sure. what are people saying? But back in the day before Goodreads was, had really taken off, like it was popular for people to have their own blogs where they would do book reviews. And sometimes people still will do that. Or YouTube where they have book reviews and stuff like that, these little channels. And I used to Google, like, I would never Google Matthew LeDrew. I would Google Matthew LeDrew review and, and see if, oh, like, nice. what people were saying. Um, that doesn't work anymore, and it really makes me sad because now what comes up is it tells me, like if I type in Matthew Ledger review and hit enter, it gives me the things I have reviewed on Goodreads. Like it thinks I'm looking for reviews on Your, yourself, yeah. And I'm like, no, that's that's not what I want. That's the worst. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, Andrew Hawthorne. What is something that you love that you would give up forever in order to be a better or more successful writer? Let's pretend that Mephisto has appeared to you and he is offering you a, 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 a thing. You have to give up your marriage in order to save Aunt May or something like that. You're the only person who will understand that reference I've ever had on this show. I do understand that reference. Yes. It's not the, a very good storyline, though. Classic comic. It's way talking about. It's the greatest. No. <laughs> um, um, it's interesting, you know, like, as a tangent, there was a, a period in comics where suddenly all the heroes who had been married 20 years earlier were suddenly single again or divorced. Yeah. And that definitely has nothing to do with the fact that all the people that were writing them were getting divorces at the time. Yeah, nothing. Uh, but we'll nothing. see. Um, what would I give up to be a better writer? I mean, I don't know, ice cream, I guess. I wouldn't give up a lot to be a better writer. There's things that I value more than my writing. I shouldn't say that. That's true, though. But, like, it's a bit of a catch-22 that I always want to write a story about. Like, if you would give something you love up, did you really love it? Yeah. Nothing that I really love is something that is worth giving up for my writing. <laughs> I'll do something else. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, Andrew Hawthorne, if you could do something differently as a child, or no, that question is really just another question in disguise. I'm not going to ask that question. Uh, Andrew Hawthorne, does your family support your career as a writer? They do. I, uh, my, uh, my mother and father were both music teachers. And so I grew up being told that, again, if all else fails, I should definitely not become a music teacher. So, uh, I, 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 so they always supported me in, in that respect. Um, you know, uh, they, <laughs> they definitely, the way, you know, every, everybody's mom's different. And uh, the way my mom works is that as a kid uh, or as an adult, I would write something and I'd be like, mom, look, I wrote a story. And she'd be like, oh yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, what do you think about it? And and she's like, uh, well, you know, like there's some typos down here and stuff. I'm like, yeah, but you know, do do you like it? You know, like, 
and, and she would say, well, I like everything you do. I love you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was, that was as far as that was going to go. So that was the support I was getting. And, and, you know, like she, she does support everything that I do, but she's a very stoic mom. So, but she's also the mom that introduced me to comics and fantasy novels and, and everything that I, I love. My comic collection is inherited from her comic collection. So, so in That's that awesome. respect, she maximally supported my writing career because she introduced me to all of the writing that I love. In some ways, that 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 might actually be the optimal like way to support your children when they're writing, because I feel like there's two things that parents can do to really like curtail a young artist, and one is too little interest or or or, or negativeness. You know what I mean? And yeah. one is too much positivity, where it's like, oh, Andrew's interested in writing. Cool, he's seven. Let's put him in a bunch of writing classes and do this and do that, and like just laser focus him. Whereas like letting them discover it on their own and just like bare minimum i am going to say nothing i am data from star trek might be the yeah. best way and 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 introducing me to the things that made me passionate about writing uh, as well i remember actually uh speaking of my mom that when i i started publishing ninja turtles comics when i started writing for ninja turtles mom's first reaction was like take that so and so because she remembered when I was in grade two, she had given me like some Ninja Turtles stuff. Yep. And one of her friends was like, oh, you shouldn't be giving him that stuff. You know, that's such trash. And, and like, he shouldn't be reading those comics and he should be like reading great works. And, and like, you, you shouldn't be doing this. It's, it's gonna damage him. And, and she had taken great offense to that. Like, like, who are you to tell me how to raise my kid, right? Yeah, yeah. She was right. But, but then like, you know, 20 years later, I'm writing for Ninja Turtles and she's like, ha ha, justified. But also like, like, I hate this idea that you should give kids these like stuffy books that they won't want to read. Like the best way to get your kids, make lifetime readers out of your kids is to get them what they like reading. Just Absolutely. And and that's what, you know, another friend of my mom said, you know, she's like, I'm, I'm kind of worried. Like when I was very, very young, no, Andrew's only reading comics. And she said, he's reading. Yep. <laughs> like, what, what's your problem here? And yeah, like, like give kids, especially comics. Comics are, are so easy to get into yep. when you're an early reader learning to read. You should find the right comics that have a simple vocabulary that really uh, get kids interesting. There's lots of great comics out there like that. And yeah, they don't have to come out reading Hamlet. They're gonna do that later. They're gonna get interested in that stuff after they've been reading comics for 10 years. So there's lots of great ways to encourage kids to read. And if you encourage kids to read enough, you're probably encouraging them to write as well. Yeah, no, a, a friend of mine's daughter was, uh, when she was seven or eight, was having a really hard time, yeah, this is a few years ago now, but uh, having a really hard time learning to read. And her mom was pulling at her hair and I'm like, get her something she's interested in. What's her favorite TV show? And at the time it was My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. I went down to Time Masters, the local comic book store, bought an entire run of the comics they were doing with IDW, as well as a couple, like, not, like, for kids novels and stuff like that they did. Just brought them all over. She was reading in a month. She wanted to read about the characters she liked, so yeah. she learned how to do it. As adults, we tend to overthink this stuff when it comes to kids uh, uh, growing up. Kids are, are they're, they're extremely versatile and adaptive and and you just gotta pay attention to who your kid is and and, and do that kind of stuff. And, and, and comics are a, a boon, a tool that has come down from heaven and given to you, the parent. So all, all the parents uh, watching this should immediately go uh, to downtown comics or, or wherever and buy a bunch of of comics to give to your children. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of, uh, Andrew, uh, what is your favorite childhood book? Book that you read when you were a child or whatever? My favorite childhood book was The Iron Man by Ted Hughes. Um, mm -hmm. It was turned into the movie The Iron Giant, which I've still not seen, but I've heard is very, very good. Yeah. But, um, but The Iron Man, the book, I think is different from that in that it was much more abstract. Ted Hughes was primarily a poet, um, and uh, and it's very weird. And he, you know, he uh, he fights a dragon the size of North America, and um, like there's there's lots of cool stuff in that book that 
I was just obsessed with when I was a kid. Uh, and it was my favorite book for a very, very long time. So, um, and, and there's lots of weird kids books that are amazing. The very first book I ever read was called The Ghost with the Halloween Hiccups. So I guess I'll recommend that one too. The Halloween Hiccup. Oh, there's so many books I've got to check out now. Okay. Um, uh, Andrew Hawthorne, what is the first book you ever remember making you cry? The first book I ever remember making me cry. Um, why do you get your fingers crossed? What, what do you think? There's, there's one answer. I'm not going to say what it is, but there's one answer like 90% of people give. And I'm just waiting. I've got a check mark where it's like, it's another one for this book. And I'm just like, I it's become a meme. What's a book that I that made me cry? Um, I, I remember a book. It didn't make me cry. I closed it and threw it out. <laughs> Okay. Um, and that was Frankenstein. It was a, a children's version of Frankenstein in some way. And I was reading it late at night. And I got to the place where, I don't know if, if, if you've never read Frankenstein, but okay. I'm familiar with the characters. He, he in, in the actual book, he builds the bride of Frankenstein, but he never animates her. He doesn't bring her to life. Okay. Um, and so I got to that section of the book and, and, Victor Frankenstein realizes he's building the bride and he realizes he's made a horrible mistake. And I came to the line. And so I tore the thing apart and went. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't know, I was like seven or something. So yeah, I, I wasn't into that. It didn't make me cry though, per se. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe like Watchmen, the comic where um, they, uh, they beat an old man to death at a certain point in that, and that really upset me. At the start. Yeah, they'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 do, what do people normally say is a book that made them cry? Where the Red Fern Grows. That book traumatized so many children. See, now I never read that one. So Me neither. I, but, you know, I was a weird kid. Like, I remember I watched Old Yeller maybe a hundred times when I was a kid, and I loved it. It was just a fun adventure movie, and everybody's like, oh, Old Yeller, you know, he dies at the end. I'm like, yeah, you know, but he was sick. <laughs> like, yeah, that's the one that people are always like, "Oh, the dog." And uh, for some reason, as a kid, nowadays, if I see a movie where where the dog dies, I would be very upset because I have a beloved dog here with me. Yep. But for some reason, Old Yeller never bothered me. Same, and, and people, I have a very glib answer to that, where it's like, "Well, a story only has a happy ending based on where you choose to end it." On a long enough timeline, all stories end in death. And that usually makes people look at me like I'm insane. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, Andrew Hawthorne, what other authors are you friends with and how do they help you become a better writer? What other authors am I friends with? Um, I am friends with, uh, when I was getting into Turtles, uh, I'm... I met a lot of the other guys that were writing Turtles at the time, uh, and particularly Jake Black, who's uh, a writer of several uh, Turtles books, and is and he's also written a lot of Superman books, and he currently is employed by the WWE, and he's writing wrestling books, and uh, and he is perhaps the nicest guy uh, anybody has ever met, and nice. at the time he was uh, dealing with. Uh, a form of cancer and he he was going through chemotherapy and and was really like it was really weighing on him he beat he kicked cancer's butt and he's doing much better um but like he was just he he was always great with advice and he was just a great he is a great guy to hang around and and the most way that he helped me with my career was the year my turtles book came out he uh he was sitting at the Mirage table and was like, hey, you want to take my chair and, and sit at the Mirage booth and like sign books for a while and I'll just go wander around and stuff. So he like, like gave up his seat at the table for a few hours nice. so that I could like live the comic dream and be sitting there with like Steve Murphy and Peter Laird at, at the Ninja Turtles table 
meeting fans of Ninja Turtles and selling my book and, and talking about turtles. And, uh, and, and, you know, you got to pay for those chairs. He paid for that chair, but he was fine with it because he's an amazing guy. So Jake Black, go find all of his work. Uh, he's written a bunch of Smallville. I think he wrote, like there's currently cards out for the Picard series, Star Trek Picard. And he yep. wrote the backs of all those. Like he's a brilliant writer. He's done a lot of really interesting stuff. Nice. Yeah. I will check out more of that, especially as uh, I'm going to check and see what issues and Ninja Turtles he wrote and check those out too. He wrote a bunch of Tales issues. I think he wrote the last Tales issue. Oh, um, ooh, that's he, good. He, yeah. He's written a lot of that stuff. So, high um, recommend. Awesome. Awesome. I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up that your wife is a writer. My wife is a brilliant writer. Uh, she has a PhD. The way I usually describe Ansley is that she is a Yale graduate belly dancing model who is also a published author. So yeah. she is, she's the most brilliant, wonderful person I've ever met. Yes. Anyway, she, I'm she glad is, you brought her up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, hey, who are your friends and how do they make you, who are your friends who are writers and how do they make you a better writer? And I'm just sitting here like, he better bring up his wife. <laughs> I mean, she makes me a better everything. Um, yeah, sure. So you know, like all all joy I have in my life comes from her. So there's that. But she is, she but, is you a, know, she makes Ainsley, me a better writer. She is she is a brilliant human being, one of the top ten smartest people I've met in real life. She is. It's true. And um, you know, she. Uh, I could talk about Ansley all day, obviously, but you know, we co-host Apocalypse Then on CBC, uh, which is a show we both write and host. Uh, but all of our writing, uh, all of all of the writing that we do, we pass back and forth and say, like, is this good? Does this make sense? And we help refine each other's stuff. And like, that's an important process. I think Stephen King in On Writing, he said, like, everybody, you, you, you've always got to write for an audience. And his audience was always his wife. And she was always his first reader. And uh, and that's true for us, too. We we make each other better writers and and and. We, we're always very careful, like when we're like, oh, hey, you know, here's my here's my new story. Like, can you can you read this? And and then we'll say something like, and what I really want you to say is that it's great. Yeah. And then later, maybe you can tell me where the mistakes are. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and so the first read is like, this is amazing. And then in a week, we're like, okay, can you read it again and tell me what I need to fix? Like, yes, okay, you got to fix this paragraph and you got to do this. And and then we refine it, but. That's to have a partner like that. It doesn't have to be your spouse. It can be a friend or your agent or your or some peers in the community. It can be a writing circle. Um, is invaluable. Yeah. Andrew Hawthorne, what is your favorite comic book character? Superman is my favorite character in all of fiction. Really? Um, he is he is the ultimate form of the protagonist. He's the closest we have to the platonic form of the protagonist. And uh, and and I would, as J. Michael Straczynski said, I would crawl over ten miles of broken glass and monkey vomit to write for Superman. Um, so I uh, now that said, I, I don't really believe that the great Superman story has ever been told. Um, no. There's no Dark Knight Returns for Superman. Uh, it, the closest we have is probably Superman the movie. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I love I love everything about Superman. I love his supporting cast. I love the character. And, uh, and, and yeah, that was an easy answer. <laughs> there you go. Andrew Hawthorne, what is your favorite and least favorite Stephen King novel? I've never read any Stephen King novels. Okay. Um, I know about them. Uh, I will say that uh, my favorite is probably, my favorite is probably It. Um, I've read part of It and I've seen uh, the original movie and, and the new movie. And what I like about it is that it's a, a kid danger genre story. Yep. Um, and kid danger was a really big thing in the eighties. Um, you know, E.T., the Goonies and the greatest film of the eighties, the monster squad. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of like, you know, nowadays people try to make an 80s movie and they make Stranger Things. It's a Kid Danger movie or yeah. like Summer of 84 is a really great Kid Danger movie. And, and it is like that. I love a gang of misfit kids going up against an unstoppable monster. And it's going to be a great time for me anytime. What's his worst novel? I don't know. They're probably all great. Uh, Andrew Hawthorne, as a writer, uh, what would you choose as your mascot like if you're if you were if there was a magical spell and your writingness was transformed into an animal sidekick 
what would that animal be? Like, do I want to cuddle this animal or is this a representation of my writing? It's a representation of your writing, purely. Um, I would want it to be a, uh, probably like the Loch Ness Monster. Okay. That'd be kind of cool. It would live in a big lake. Um, it would be mysterious. It would be uh, old as, as the dinosaurs are old. Uh, and when it came time to deadlines, nobody could find it anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm shocked it's not a turtle, but it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. what can you do? How many unpublished or half-finished books do you have? Um, I had a lot when I was a kid. Right now, I have, if you include comic series that I've worked on, uh, I have four. I have a play, a novel, and two comic series. Nice. And the play is very close to being done. Um, and uh, the rest of it, uh, not so much. But hey, I hope so. And I've got a lot of other things that I wish were close to being done and not done. But yeah. I'm not quite that far along with those. That's how it goes. Yeah, like it. Look forward to seeing some of those. Uh, Andrew Hawthorne, what kind of research do you do and how long do you spend researching before starting a project? Oh, a lot. And, um, and I continue researching throughout the project, really. Uh, it depends on what you're doing, though. Um, with, uh, with a novel that I'm working on now, I've read maybe uh, like a dozen books on uh, the Regency period and, and on, on different things around there. Um, and I've got, uh, for, for a comic series that I worked on a while ago that happened in the Napoleonic era at Royal Navy, I, I literally have three bookshelves of books on that. I also, like, I should use the library more instead of just buying the books that I'm researching on, but I worked at a bookstore at the time. It was very easy to do. Um, so I, I, a lot of research is the answer, and I think research is especially important because, um, you know, it's a trap. You, you can fall into, especially if you're writing fiction, uh, suddenly realizing that you're just writing nonfiction history and you're talking about this era and you're like, wait a second, I, I do, this is fiction. I do have maximum control over what happens here. It doesn't just have to be a, a lesson in what happens. So you don't want to over-research stuff in that. You don't want to be beholden to the research, no. but you do want it to inform your practice. And, and especially if you don't know where you're going next, if you've got like a writer's block or whatever, you need to feed it with something and what you feed it with is research and that will get you out of the writer's block every time. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, a, it's a balancing act though. There's a like, oh, enough research that you've got like the building blocks in your head to reshape them and build whatever you want. Like if each piece of research is like a Lego block, you need enough to build your, your crap, your right. thing that you're building into Legos. But then there's the rabbit hole problem. I know way too many authors who like when they sit down to write for three hours, spend two hours and 49 minutes on Wikipedia, just down the rabbit hole, you know? Yeah, it can happen. You, so you need to know the limitations of what you're trying to accomplish with this. Yep. Um, how much of, of this research is really going to inform what you're doing and, and how much of it is gonna overwhelm what you're doing and maybe clog it up. I've got a, a problem with a novel uh, that I, I think I mentioned earlier that I've read a bunch of books for that now I'm stuck in, in the reality of what was going on at the time, and that's interfering with the story that I'm trying to tell. So you don't want that either. No, yeah. Andrew Hawthorne, do, do you like think of writing as like a spiritual practice, man? Um, I think of poetry writing as a spiritual practice. I think of, I think um, in terms of, I think travel is a spiritual practice. I think going places, uh, being in, in spiritual places, and those don't have to be churches, they can be, uh, or temples um, uh, are, uh, are the most spiritual aspects. Like a lot of people being outside, especially here in Newfoundland where it's incredible, um, is, is spiritual practice. And it does inform your writing and it, and it gives you the, uh, the power to get through tough stuff. Writing itself is is immensely a chore. <laughs> so yes. I'm not going to say like, oh, this is so great. Some people are like that. Uh, I am not. 
All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.